morning, everyone. Today is March 4th, 2021, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour. We're here to talk about international mediation, lessons we can learn from each other. The New Possibilities Hour is, as always, part of the Will Work for Food project, founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in the spring of 2020, when the lockdowns began. There's no charge for these great webinars, Rather, we ask you to contribute to a food bank of your choice if you're able to do so, or one uh, indicated by our speakers if you care to do that. We are so appreciative of our generous audiences who have contributed so much to fight food insecurity since the lockdowns began. And I'd like to have one of my favorite parts of every week's webinar when I ask my wonderful co-host, Jean Lawler, to give us the running total. <laughs> of just how generous our audiences have been to date. Jean, take it away. Well, as always, a very generous audience. Um, $83,715 US is uh, what Natalie can account for as of now. And you know that there are people who've donated and have not even uh, told her what, she, what they've uh, donated. So thank you so much. And no matter how big or small the contribution, is so appreciated by somebody as they eat their dinner or eat their breakfast. Thank you all so much. And again, if you're comfortable letting Natalie know the amount of your contribution, we're delighted to add it to the running total. And now let's get to the stars of our show. We're really excited. We're really gonna have some fun today. We've got three great mediators from different countries, different cultures, different parts of the world to talk about what they've learned from each other and others in the international arena and what they'd like to teach others in the international arena as well. So let's start with Emily Huber Starlinger. She is in Austria. Uh, she is a negotiation coach and mediator registered with the list of mediators of the Austrian Ministry of Justice and accredited with CME in Singapore and CEDAR in England. Her focus of interest is the resolution of commercial disputes and in particular, those relating to banking and finance, healthcare, pharmaceutical services, M&A transactions, corporate disputes, and investment protection agreements. In addition to her work as mediator and negotiation coach, she worked as an Austrian qualified lawyer for 10, more than 10 years. At the end of 2020, she finally decided to focus on mediation and negotiation exclusively and set up her own firm tailored solutions. Emily, we're so happy to have you here. Proceeding in alphabetical order to Jeff Sharp. Jeff is a mediator with a focus on the resolution of cross-border commercial disputes in Asia and Europe. Chambers and Partners describes him in 2020 as a truly an international mediator and tenacious in his pursuit of a settlement. Jeff conducts his cross-border mediations online during the COVID restrictions. He's otherwise based at Maxwell Mediators Singapore, Britcourt Chambers London, and Clifton Chambers Wellington. He's also ranked in Chambers UK 2021 and is described by Who's Who Legal as a mediation megastar. Jeff has recent experience in mediating insurance, financial sector class actions, country-to-country -country commercial disputes, Asian and Middle Eastern oil and gas, aviation, energy infrastructure, and construction disputes. When we were all still traveling in 2019 and 2020, Jeff conducted in-person mediations in Singapore, Korea, the United Kingdom, Switzerland, Austria, and New Zealand, and uh, prior to COVID travel restrictions, further mediations in Singapore. Earlier this year, Jeff was appointed to the International Advisory Board of the Office of the Ombudsman for United Nations Funds and Programs, headquartered in New York, where he joins a small group of senior mediators having oversight of the UN's Global Mediation Panel. He has uh, any number of honors. We could go on and on. In his previous career, Jeff was a litigation partner at Bell Gully and began his legal career in Melbourne with global law firm King and Wood. Malisons. And third, we have Jody Sin. Jody is a mediator and a dispute resolution lawyer in Hong Kong. She has been accredited 
by various local and international bodies, including the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, HKMAAL, the Law Society of Hong Kong, International Mediation Institute, and the United Nations Global Mediation Panel. She mediates a broad range of commercial disputes. She's also an adjunct professor at the University of Hong Kong School of Professional and Continuing Education. She also teaches mediation and conflict resolution in two major universities in Hong Kong. 2019, Ms. Sin was awarded the JAMS Weinstein International Fellowship. She has been a distinguished fellow of the International Academy of Mediators since 2016 and became a member of its Board of Governors in 2020. I believe each of our panelists has also indicated a favorite food bank. And Natalie, I believe you've posted those in the chat. Is that correct? So we'll turn to each of our uh, panelists. We have some questions for them. And the first question that I'd like everybody, each of you to spend a couple minutes answering, we'll take it in alphabetical order, is tell us about some things you have learned about mediation and negotiation in the international arena. Emily, let's turn to you first. Please first tell us a word or two about the food bank of your choice, if you'd care to, and then tell us about some things you've learned. Thank you, Jeff. Um, to start with, thank you, Jean, Natalie, and Jeff for the invitation and the honor to speak to all of you today. Um, the food bank is one which my brother and my sister-in-law um, advised me to tell you, which is um, helpingfeedpeople.org. They are based in Rochester, Minnesota, where my brother is currently a sur surgeon at the Mayo Clinic. And um, yes, whoever likes, that's definitely a good place to um, donate to. Um, when it comes to international practice and what I learned, I would like to start with what you mentioned before. I'm based in Austria, so I did my initial training in Austria, which was a one and a half year training, um, focusing particularly on co-mediation. And at that time, it was a common theme to conduct mediations in a joint session only no private sessions. And I re can recall um, one of the trainers telling me that doing private session is something that you're just not supposed to do. Um, coming from a commercial world in the sense that I advised and um, counseled clients in arbitrations, both commercial arbitration and investor state disputes, I was very much um, convinced that joint sessions might not be the way to answer or to mediate all cases which I, I will be facing in my career. So um, I finally decided to go to England and do my CEDA training. And there I actually um, got a training on how to do private sessions and um, how to, let's say, mix them up in a way that I could do both joint and private sessions. And this is one of the cultural aspects I learned from an English mediator. And um, last year, as the pandemic um, hit the world, I learned by doing a training at Sage Mediation in Singapore, not only how to conduct mediations online, but um, also how to actually use co-mediation in a world where I don't know the co-mediator. So as we all are facing, I am I'm pretty sure of it, in commercial dispute, as soon as they become more complex and more cross-border and more multi-parties um, involved, we are currently having, or at least I see it, that one party wants to appoint one mediator and another party wants to appoint another mediator. And those two mediators don't know each other. And I think this is one of the um, challenges we are facing nowadays that we, we might need to mediate with somebody 
that we don't know. So to sum up, I think my mediation practice got very much influenced by different cultural mediation styles. And um, I, each time I do one of these trainings, I see how I'm more equipped to actually tailor the process to the needs of the dispute and the parties. So as someone uh, in your case who came to the private caucusing later in the game, what do you view as the most significant benefit of that? What, what should those of us who uh, do it, shall we say reflexively, what is the real benefit of a private caucus as you see it? The real benefit, I think, is to go into to build rapport, which is much more uh, much easier to do when you are one on one without taking having to take care of another person who might just explode in a minute. Um, or at the same time, people tend to um, be more open and speak more openly and reveal information to you, which might be necessary for you as mediator, but which they do not want the other party to know. This, I think, are the two main benefits of private meetings. But at the same time, I do see the advantages of joint sessions as well. And I wouldn't, um, there are, of course, mediations where you have to shuttle because there is no way around it. But um, if you have the possibility to put, bring both parties to the same table and have them talk together, that brings a completely new atmosphere and might even help parties to resolve their disputes. And Emily, <clears throat> Do you sometimes do some of these private sessions before the joint session, or is it only after the joint session? Well, I um, would normally start with private sessions and then enter joint sessions in order to get an impression of um, what the parties are actually looking for. Um, if I can actually put them in a room without um, having them both driving each other mad. So I think um, the best, well, for me, the best way is to get a feeling and impression for the parties first and their respective representatives, and then decide if they can actually be in the same room at the same time or not. Thank you. Jeff Sharp in New Zealand. First of all, Jeff, a word of uh, concern, a, a prayer for you and your countrymen. Understand there's been an earthquake and tsunami fears. So first of all, we hope you and your family are safe and that all New Zealanders are, are safe. I know everybody joins me in that wish for you and your fellow New Zealanders. Thanks, Jeff. We're, 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 hello, everybody. Um, greetings from New Zealand. We've just had a 7.3 earthquake about an hour and a half ago. Um, it's 5 a.m. in the morning here. It's dark and the streets are full of people. Uh, and the first, the first surge waves, tsunami waves are hitting the east coast. I'm on the other coast, the west coast. But there is a, a sense of real crisis here. So if I run out of the room, you will, you'll know why. We're getting, we're getting quite a few aftershocks of around about five magnitude. So it's certainly a serious, uh, serious earthquake. And we're, and we're used to earthquakes here. And I know that folks in California will be saying, seven, that's, that's nothing. <laughs> but anyway, we're, we're all fine. Good. So Jeff, same question to you. You mediate, uh, you're native of New Zealand, is that correct? Yes. And yes. you mediate in Singapore, the United Kingdom, uh, all over the world. Tell us a couple of things that you have learned in the international aspects of your practice that have served you well and that might serve us well also. Yeah, well, I mean, Jeff, you asked us three very interesting questions and this was my favorite. Uh, you know, what have I learned from other, from mediating outside of my, you know, home bubble? And, and I, I actually enjoyed thinking about it really. And, and I suppose there's a whole lot of 
you know, micro things I could say, but if, if, if I look at what the big lesson I've learned, I, I think it's to be a chameleon. Um, and that's, I mean, that's, I think that's easier for someone from a small country like New Zealand. We've had, we've had to fit in all our lives with, you know, other cultures because we're so small. So um, I, I've learned as much as possible, you know, while one brings one's own personality to the mediation table, as much as possible, I've learned not to be the dominant culture uh, because, you know, it is just amazing how different we all are. And, and I think there is a, I'd be really interested in anyone's comments about this. There is a homogenous commercial mediation culture that I think runs globally. So whether you're mediating in Dubai or London or LA, there is a, there is a certain mediation culture, but, but around that, there's all these differences. And um, I've learned to fit in rather than try and dominate. Uh, and as I say, I, I think New Zealanders have had to do that, you know, on a national level. And so it's, 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 a, it's probably a bit easier. Um, I mean, I do think geography is becoming more important. And so I, you know, out of a healthy dose of self-interest, I promote my homeland as the Switzerland of the Pacific. So, so that people are not threatened by my culture. And I think, I don't mean to offend anyone, but that may be different for a US mediator, a UK mediator, and frankly, an Australian mediator, because the, the, you have a big splash in the world where, where you know, my home country doesn't. So I suppose that's what I've learned. Uh, and I've learned that people are very different. I mean, I've just, just come off a long running mediation with an Eastern Bloc country and had to, and we had about 12 Zoom sessions to resolve it. We resolved it last week. And what I learned about that was their culture is very hierarchical. And I had to learn, I didn't have, didn't necessarily have the people on screen that could make decisions. And that was just the way it was because the real decision makers wouldn't come on screen and there was nothing I could do about it. And I had to work with it. So that was a good example of, I'd never expect that from a domestic mediation, but this mediation, it was hierarchical. They sent certain people to the mediation virtual table and it was why we had so many different Zoom sessions was because there was always this back and forth checking with, with those who um, were really calling the shots. And that's frustrating for a mediator. Everybody will know that. But, you know, uh, culturally, that was how it was. So th 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 that's my big lesson, I guess, Jeff. Okay, so Jeff, when you make a decision not to have your own culture dominate the mediation, what do you actually do to accomplish that? And do, do the ways you accomplish that actually reflect your culture? Yeah, very, that's a very interesting question. Probably, probably it, it does. I mean, I, I, you can't avoid bringing to the mediation table your accent. I mean, I don't think I have an accent, but many people on this call will be saying, what the heck is he saying? So you can't avoid bringing your accent you know, your personality, but I, and in some extent your ego, but, but we all know we've got to check that at the door. Um, I suppose I've just learned to pick up the cues and, you know, th this example I was, I, I, I was referring to, just not to challenge it. Just, you know, it, it's almost go with the flow. Um, and, and some things are frustrating, you know, stopping for prayers, you know, four or five times a day during the mediation, that can interrupt the flow of the mediation, but that's how it is. And, um, it's, it, and it's wonderful. You know, you sort of, you know you're mediating internationally when people are stopping for prayers. Um, so I, 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 guess, I guess the answer is I've learned to go with the flow and just not, not make a big deal of it. And, and, and just, that's my reality. How do I best navigate it? Fair enough, and thank you. Jody in Hong Kong, welcome. And same question 
so happy to have you here. Thank you, uh, wherever here is in the virtual universe. We're happy we're together. So same question to you, please. Tell us about some things you have learned operating internationally that have benefited you and your mediation practice and beyond. I think um, I've learned to listen for the unsaid from the parties. Um, I mediate cases with parties, um, well, uh, some of them from US, um, Europe, um, Asia, Malaysia, Singapore, and China, Taiwan. So even Chinese, all right, people from Hong Kong, China and Taiwan, they are very different, though they all look the same, I think, to you guys. Um, uh, I think that, well, uh, say people from Asian culture, they um, have uh, a way of um, expressing something that they don't want to um, uh, let you know. And, um, and that's why I would say that I, I learned from them how to listen for the unsaid and what I need to do with the unsaid. So uh, perhaps I illustrate with a case that I mediated um, recently, which is a, a shareholder dispute between a US party and a China party. So um, these two uh, joint venture partners, let me call them the Chinese one called say Raymond and the, the US one called Patrick. So they were in business for um, over 30 years. And in fact, the US party started that joint venture like um, in, in the generation of his father. So they've been in a long relationship, um, but things didn't, didn't go on forever. So they, they've decided to part ways and um, they need to assess the value of their shareholding. Um, the, so U.S. party started litigation in the BVI. Um, there were allegations against the Chinese party, Raymond, saying that oh, there's, there was embezzlement of funds, breach of fiduciary duties. I think you all know what those allegations are. The non-disclosure of financial information. So at the pre-mediation meeting or even at the mediation meeting, um, the, the Chinese party, Raymond was very direct. He's been saying that um, he's willing to find um, a, a purchaser to buy out um, the, the shareholding of the U.S. party. But um, I think the, those allegations that affected quite a lot the value of the shareholding. And I, I in fact, I tried to um, listen and understand what he thinks about those allegations because uh, that those were important. And he kept on saying that it's meaningless to talk about that, Jody. Um, well, he just refused. And then he said, I will find someone to buy the share. That's it. So the unsaid about these allegations, it could be uh, subject to a lot of interpretation, right? It could be that, oh, those were not true. Um, those may be true or partially true. And um, when it affects quite a lot the value of the shareholding, so when you analyze risk with parties like that, um, you, you really need to be um, careful. So it may cause you some kind of trigger on um, the, this Chinese party. And this kind of attitude, so you, I, when I reflect back this case, um, I think uh, working with the law um, to understand the party's perspective is really helpful. And um, it, it helps me to understand a little bit more uh, the style. Um, so this is something about the unset of a, of a um, Chinese party. The U.S. party also has some kind of unset. So um, I remember when we were, um, we have a, this is a two days mediation. The first day was about um, talking about the, the allegations and everything. And at the end of the day one, I asked them, well, um, what, what do you want in respect of the value of the shareholding? So he was expecting something like U.S. dollars, three million. And on day two, so we were like, like late in the afternoon, there's still like 2 million, 4 million. Um, so that was quite 2 millions apart. So he still said that he was expecting to settle at a high three number. And, and so I leave him um, <laughs> in his room. I travel to the other room and then try to like talk to the Chinese parties to see, well, where the settlement la uh, range will land. And then when I went back to the U.S. party, he said, Julie, what's the um, process? What was, what was the progress going on in the other room? I said, uh, yeah, they're going to make another offer that may not be in your range. Um, so he said, how do you know what my range is? 
I said, I don't know, but you said you expected something like a th um, high three number. So he said, well, it's already 4.30. And um, he, he said, I said that I wish to settle at a high three, but I didn't say I would not like to come down. So I think uh, in, in the very short moments, we were able to cut a deal, something like between, um, um, I think close to 3 million. So um, US party also has some unsaid and th that's the part they like about um, negotiating the numbers. So they, 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 I think on reflecting this, um, I think uh, mediators should not assume. Um, you may not be able to get the answer even when you try to dig deeper at the moment. Um, but park that and try to um, retrieve that later and see whether you can get more information. So that's my um, learning from the parties. So the, the great lesson of be curious operates uh, to an even greater, more intense extent when you're dealing with people from different cultures. Correct, precisely. Great. And Jody, forgive me, I forgot to ask you and Jeff to mention your food banks. At, uh, at the beginning of the presentation. Let's fill in that right now. Jody, the food bank that you would like us to consider, please, is? It's Food Angel. So the website is um, foodangel.org.hk. And that's in Hong Kong and serves the community where you live. Yes, it's a non food right. organization. Great. And Jeff, briefly, the food bank that you would like us to consider, please, is? If anyone is good enough, uh, Kaibosh. Kai is the Maori word for food, kaibosh, K-A-I-B-O-S-H. I volunteer there every Saturday afternoon. Would love your support. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, now that we've talked about what each of you has learned, I want to give each of you an opportunity to teach something that the rest of us can learn. And we have 50 people online here. Many more will be watching the recording. I see looking over our viewers, we have people from many different continents and a lot of different cultures. So let's go in reverse order. And Jody, let's turn to you first. You've got a, an incredible classroom here, eager to, eager to soak up knowledge. What, what's a lesson you would like to teach all of us, please? Um, I, I would say about different styles of negotiation. People from different cultures, they have different styles. Um, so different paces when they negotiate. So respect each other's style and um, participate in the process with a lot of patience. And I would think that if you mediate with parties um, in Asia or somehow from say mainland China or Taiwan or Hong Kong, um, look for or pay attention if there are any um, shadow decision makers. So just now Jeff mentioned about um, uh, uh, in a hierarchical culture, you have difficulty in getting those decision makers to the table. Um, I, I would think that for Jeff's situation, at least you know there are some kind of um, decision makers somewhere. Um, in, in Asian culture, sometimes you may not know until very late. So I remember there was a probate case that I mediated that was um, uh, between a Hong Kong party and um, a mainland party. So um, we uh, the, the, the main thing that the parties in dispute was to fight over the title to a property left by the deceased. Um, before the mediation, I always meet the parties in a pre-mediation session, and we talk about different things and get to know the lawyers and the parties, etc. Um, even after the pre-mediation session, I try to um, uh, know from the lawyer, well, uh, what are you going to do, uh, value of the property, do we have any data or information? So um, the lawyer said, I don't know. I don't know whether he's truthful or not, but anyway, he said he don't know. I, I, I don't want to push at, as, at early at that stage. And so uh, on the day of the mediation, we began um, negotiating like at around 12 o'clock. And of course the mainland party began with a high number. Um, so th I think the valuation of the property of fair one is something like US dollars, 1 million. So he began with something like 2.5. And, and then I said, well, let's go for lunch. So 2.30 when we come back, 
Certainly, the mainland party said, um, Jody, I've decided that to um, offer to buy out the other person's share. So starting from 2.30 to 5, um, almost three hours, we spent a lot of time in, well, negotiating the value of that share. And at 5 o'clock, a nightmare came. Um, so the mainland party said, Jody, um, I think I can't buy, um, buy out the, the, the other party's share, who is the nephews of the deceased. So I said, um, why? Because um, I have spoken with my relatives in the village or in my hometown, and they say that in fact, it's very difficult for me to raise funds um, to buy out the other party's share. So um, I think I have a, a lot of assumptions when he said that um, he would like to buy out the other person's share. I didn't realize that he made that proposal, but in fact, he didn't have the money, number one. Number two was um, there were a lot of shadow decision makers around him. And when I got that piece, I looked at the lawyer. Um, the lawyer said, um, are you sure? And um, I think he did not um, know that before. So some cultures, I will say that they do not easily trust people. So the lawyer shared with me, well, privately said that um, he in fact um, spent a lot of time in getting this um, client's trust um, so that he came to mediation and then we tried to work out a deal. So lessons learned, um, and I want to share with everyone is, well, people have different negotiating styles. Uh, watch out if there are any shadow decision makers and some people, they do not trust the others a lot. So that may make the work of a mediator even more difficult. Fair enough, and thank you. Jeff, your turn. Please teach us a little. Okay. Um, I've just noticed some names on the board. Um, so I just give a shout out to Rachel in Scotland, who's doing amazing things for mediation in Scotland. So Rachel, nice to see you. Um, look, look I, th I think um, what I'd like to share is, is nothing revolutionary, uh, uh, but it's been emphasized to me by COVID. And that's this notion that mediation is absolutely a process and not an event. And I was coming to that realization over the last five years, most of my mediations were not um, being big bang mediations of one day and we either succeed or not, often not, unfortunately, um, but, but, but they were being spread out over a number of different sessions. And I think COVID has simply accelerated that for me. And I talked just before of having 12 Zoom sessions in this mediation last week, and that's not uncommon and I, I think I think as I say COVID has really um, propelled that forward and uh, I think it's a good thing because this asynchronous communication I find is so helpful and my experience is Zoom sessions are one, two, four, five hours but they're not 18 hours as they were at the start of COVID. They are short sharp sessions where we go away, we do some work, we come back. And of course, people are much more prepared to come back on screen because it's much easier for them. And half of them are sitting in, in, in their houses in London anyway. So what else are they going to do? So, so I, I just think the process, not an event, has finally come of age. And as a 20-year veteran, it absolutely works. And I, I, I guess I'm I'm preaching to the choir here because what I'd much I'd much prefer to be saying this to litigation and arbitration lawyers who quite understandably still have a one day mentality when actually they need to be prepared to be putting in time, you know, over a series of weeks uh, or, or months. Uh, I've got a had a Singapore. Uh, slash American matter that's been going a year and a half and we just you know decisions take six months to make and and that's just the way it is and that harks back to something I said earlier so um, I think that's that's what I would like to share and and of course that fundamentally has changed 
what skills we need as mediators. And I think some mediators will flourish in that new structure. Other mediators won't. A and it fundamentally has changed our work structure. So I can't anymore say I've got a mediation that day. I can look after my grandson on this day and I've got a mediation that day. I've got meetings peppered all through. And, and, and you know, um, working in the night shift, uh, do, do, you know, back down here in New Zealand, our, our time zone never is never gets better. Our time, time zone is a complete train, train wreck. So it's, it's fundamentally changed the way I work. And I'd be really interested to hear from others whether it's doing the same to them. But that, that would be my, my big point, Jeff. So Jeff, is there uh, one skill that stands out above the rest that you think we need to learn? And is there one skill or habit that you think we need to shed? Well, uh, I'm still feeling my way on this myself. And I, I, I do think there are different skills needed on screen than off screen. Certainly different organizational skills. But I suppose at a high level, the skill that I'm looking to achieve, and I don't think I have yet, is my in-person mediations, a, a, a senior lawyer said to me last year, been watching you, Jeff, trying to work out what you, you know, what you're doing. And, and she said, and I finally really worked out, you give the room energy. And I thought that was a wonderful, high level way to describe what a mediator does. We we plug a battery into the room and we, we're, the, we're, we're an energy source, just one of them, but we're a main energy source for the room. And I suppose the skill that I'm looking to achieve is to transmit that energy down the, down the wire to the people at the other end of the screen. And, and I think that's not straightforward. Um, I, I, you know, just from a practical level, I mediate standing up. And I find that that allows me to, to try and achieve that, 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 that sort of energy, but I'm, I'm still experimenting. Fantastic, Jeff. I've sometimes heard that same thought expressed. A doctor friend of mine said, we're like the anesthesiologists. We keep blood circulating through the system. We keep the patient alive while the surgeons or the litigators, they get all the glory, but we, we, we keep the patient alive while the uh, while the others do their their work and get the credit and that's fine yeah, yeah. And yeah that's well fine. Look, we're all backroom i i i i work much better in the shadows than in the light <laughs> emily please we'd love to hear from you what would you like to teach us um the thing i would like to share with you adds to what um jody said with regard to um be be aware of negotiation styles is be aware of um, the different mediation experience people might have, in particular if you do cross-border mediations, and to prepare, be prepared to actually do more explanation of what mediation is to one person than you might need to do for, to others. Um, as said, um, imagine a party from Austria being familiar only with joint sessions and you come in and say, now we're going to start with private meetings. They're going to be puzzled or at least um, in, in, or um, say they don't want it because they don't know what it is and what it might do for them. Um, so in my practice, at least, I start normally if I take on a new case, try to initially already investigate if the parties have mediation experience, if yes, um, what, the, what the mediation style was, if they can tell where the mediators came from, because then you can at least see, I mean, American um, mediators, as far as I know, are more familiar with private sessions than some Europeans might be. Um, this is one thing. And then also if they have um, as how much they are prepared to prepare for mediations. It is a great, I experienced a great difference between 
people who actually conducted mediations already and know um, how to write a preparatory brief in comparison to those who are completely unfamiliar with the process of mediation and you tell them to write a preparatory brief and they are sometimes even just handing on you it in the statement of claim, which is nice to have, but definitely not a good thing to work with as a mediator. So my advice would be to actually pay some attention to um, see where the people coming from with regard to mediation styles. It's fascinating. I can think of mediations that I have done where everybody's from Los Angeles, where I live. Indeed, I can think of mediations I've done where everybody's office is in the same zip code and we get just as much variation <laughs> in terms of what they expect, what their past experience has been, what, um, what they expect of the mediator and all the rest. Let me ask you, Emily, how do you go about ferreting these things out? You said how you do, do invest. You well, you said before the mediation, you do investigation into these things. Well, you, ask questions. What, what, to, to who? Do you do it? You call the lawyers, you call the clients, you do it by phone, you do it by Zoom these days. What are the, what are the steps uh, you use that, that we uh, might learn from? Um, it depends on how it all starts. If a lawyer contacts me and asks me um, about whether I would be willing to mediate, I would normally ask that party right away. And then whenever I have the first contact with the other party, I would ask that party. If that's on Zoom um, or on telephone, um, it depends on how it all, yes, how it all begins. Um, I normally do it in person. I don't do it in writing. That's just, I, it just never happened. I might do it. I didn't think of it yet, but um, normally I do it in person. Yes. So when you, when you say in person, I assume you're, we're not talking oh, about going to a coffee shop anymore. No, we, we, we used no. to. What is in person? What do you find most effective, uh, the most effective incarnation of in person or iteration of in person right now? Okay, so in person, I mean um, by telephone um, or via Zoom, um, but not in by. So I compare now with regard to that question, in person being orally and um, not in writing. Okay. Now the third head of discussion, I wanted to give each of the three of you, Jeff, Jody, Emily, an opportunity to put out there What's a challenge or a question that you have? What do you want to learn next? And how can our other two uh, international panelists help you? You've given so much, we want you to get something out of this presentation too. So let me just, uh, you know, let me just put it out there. Anybody who wants to ask the question. Um, Jeff, I'll, I'll have a go. Um, I, th I think I'd like to ask everybody, you know, what the heck is going to happen next is, is my big question. I would really like to know what people think is coming. I, I, I believe, and it, and it may be my little bubble, but I believe mediation is in a, in a fundamental state of change. And it's so exciting to still be in the business when this is happening. And, you know, we've all had to upskill technically been a wonderful journey for an old dinosaur uh, you know and I, i'm just so grateful that i'm still around when when we're going through this tectonic change because i think we will come out of covid doing things differently and new zealand um you know we've shut our borders uh, uh and we're we're going down the toilet fast but at least we have no real community spread so domestically i'm doing in-person mediations. I'm flying to Christchurch on Monday to do a mediation with, you know, parties around the table. But it's interesting, we have been locked down, we did do Zoom, we've come out of lockdown, we are doing in-person mediations, and we might, we might be a, a little uh, test, test bed for the rest of you. We have bought certain practices through COVID, and, 
and into the into the you know normal world and and i wonder whether that's our future that we will have these hybrid processes where doing three four five caucus sessions on zoom and that's the sort of the the intake private caucus we have a in-person phase not not a mediation day but an in-person phase where we hit the ground running because we've had all this we've had all these meetings beforehand and then we have a a post in-person phase where we we tidy things up and i i wonder whether that's the general sort of cadence of a mediation going forward i'd i'd, I'd, I'd be fast and i don't know the answer i'd love people's views jody emily what do you think jody please yeah um, I started doing a lot of mediations in a hybrid mode since COVID. Um, back home, I, I find that most of the parties or even the lawyers, well, Hong Kong is a small place and people still prefer to do face-to-face -face mediation. So I have a lot of cases that have been deferred for almost a year. <laughs> but some, um, in the end, we... Uh, we did it by way of a hybrid mode because, um, well, because there's court, court hearing and people wanted to do it. So a hybrid mode, um, I think is something that uh, we've been doing. I think some of the Hong Kong mediators also doing quite a lot right now. Um, I think it's more efficient, it saves costs, and that may be something that we will be doing quite a lot in the future. Mm. So Jody, when you do an in-person mediation after everybody's been locked down for a year, mm. does it seem weird? Does it seem different? Do people wear masks? Do they shake hands with each other? What is, what's it like? And no hands shaking. <laughs> That's what the government told people, no hands shaking. So we uh, bump our elbows um, and I always, when I, um, and when I went into a room, uh, I will introduce myself. My name is Jody, and then I will pull down my mask a little bit, and then this is how I look like. Um, so just in case you won't get the wrong mediator, <laughs> so I put it back later. So um, that makes some kind of fun. And um, people are, are used to well, wearing masks at a mediation, so um, I, I don't think it, it affected us a lot. Um, uh, we are quite used to that because I think we we had the lesson of SARS back in 2003. Um, so wearing a mask is not a problem to us. Uh, and do people sit at six foot intervals around a huge conference table or do people sit the way they used to? Oh, I got places with larger rooms. They sit further apart. When the pandemic was uh, really serious, um, some parties requested not to have a joint session with everyone in the room, but they they could tolerate like meeting the lawyers or some parties um, meeting themselves. So we, we have some kind of variations. Um, insofar that people prefer prefer to do the face-to-face um, -face mediation. I think um, we, we had quite a lot of precautions and um, we're still okay with that. Um, but I, I, as far as the hybrid mode, sometimes I do not feel very comfortable because some parties, um, they join by Zoom and they like to have a whole group of people gathered in the conference room and then they talk to uh, the other party uh, and to the mediator. Um, for that, uh, kind of a hybrid mode is quite difficult because I really can't see the facial expression of the people. I would say it's worse than um, having a full online mediation if we have parties joining in that way. So um, I think there's something that we need to learn maybe to get the parties to like um, uh, adjust a little bit so that well we can see everyone. Sometimes not seeing the facial expression, you miss a lot of um, body language. Mm. Hmm. Emily, can, can you help teach Jeff something? Well, I would say it depends, as always. Um, I think um, a lot of mediations might go the way described, meaning to start with private sessions online via Zoom and then um, meet in person for, the, for an actual mediation session. Um, Whereby I think there are 
disputes were such, in particular, if, if you think of a large family owned companies where in-person meetings are a necessity, I think they will still be conducted um, in person instead of online or via Zoom. Um, as long as this pandemic is going on, and I personally um, hope to be it to be over as soon as possible, but I read a, um, a scientist indicating that we might deal with mutations and the pandemic situation as such for the next 10 years. I think that at least when it comes to um, travel restrictions and all that, we just re will really need to get to used um, to online mediation and to do this um, more and more professionally. And the, the need to be flexible, the different mm -hmm. people, different clients will have different uh, views. thoughts mm -hmm. and fe different views about meeting in person or not meeting in person. <clears throat> so as always needing to be sensitive to the views of the participants in each individual case is, is critical. Jody or Emily, uh, would you like to put out a question or challenge that you're facing? Get some help from your other two panelists. Uh, perhaps I'll go first. Um, well, we always uh, see parties in a situation like um, uh, with uh, impaired trust. Um, relationship ruins, they don't trust each other. So I would think that uh, people from different cultures will have different ways of like um, restoring trust or repairing relationship. Uh, so I hope um, the other panelists can share something uh, on this. How to rebuild trust between parties. <laughs> Jeff, Emily? Um, well, I mean, that's, that's a bit like what is life uh, in, in, <laughs> in terms of the <laughs> breadth of the question. Jody, I, I, I don't have an answer, I, and I know you're doing quite a bit of research on this, so I'll be very, I'll be more interested in your, in the results of your research, but, but I, I, I suppose, I, I, I think, I think we all have our own ways of doing that, and I don't know what my way is, other than get alongside people and try and give them, you know, some objectivity about you know, those they're in conflict with, that they don't have two horns, that actually, you know, uh, if one view of it is that they, you know, they, they have their own truth. Uh, and, uh, you know, all that's pretty standard stuff, but, but I think any, any mediator who is successful has found a way to um, improve trust, not, 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 not necessarily get trust, but improve the trust enough to allow people to talk to each other and, and, and maybe resolve things. And that's why I, I scratch my head, and that's probably why I'm bald, but I scratch my head because I do not get why there is a move globally away from joint sessions. Because, uh, Jeff, you'll know who said this, it was one of our IAM um, um, seniors, you know, be, you know because, um, we can talk, therefore we must. Was that was that David Plant? I think said that. It, it, could, it could well have been. Yeah. And and uh, it's simple as that. Why would you not talk? And 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 if you want to repair trust, if you if you want to get into a more trusting space, because being lack of space is difficult on both parties, then you know the the joint session as we call it, is just a magical place for that to happen. And I, and I still believe after 25 years, it's the engine room of the mediation. And any mediation mediator who's worth their salt knows how to operate in the confused environment of a joint session. And I, I, just, I, I just hang my head, and it's something I've been talking about for 10 years, I hang my head when I experience caucus only models and I, I, I just see them being so inefficient and 
you know, selfishly, not what I signed on for as a mediator. I signed on to sit around a table with people helping oil the wheels of the discussion. Sorry, that's a bit of a rant, but it's one of my <laughs> joint sessions is one of my triggers. <laughs> okay, Emily? Um, I think, um, so agreeing to everything that J Jeff said, um, I think building trust, I think it's a def question of definition of trust. It's um, because I think what people or some mediation parties need to understand is there can be, um, you can't trust each other in the negotiation, but you don't need to trust with regard to other aspects of your life. So, um, so not uh, to open up everything, but at the same time to limit it to those issues that you actually talk about on the table. I think that's a very different aspect. And I think we need to um, like move these things apart. If you understand what I mean, it's not trusting each other in a mediation is something different than trusting each other in real life. Thank, thank you. Let me take the moderator's prerogative and add a word of my own. You know, there's all kinds of different cases. In some cases, restoring trust may not be a priority. Think about what we sometimes call red car, blue car, right? A intersection collision. Well, those people maybe are not too interested. It may not be a priority to them. At the other end of the spectrum, you have trust and estate disputes where you may have uh, parents and children, siblings at war with each other, and you think, boy, if these people could restore a relationship, it would be great. And sometimes at the end of a mediation where restoring relationships or trust seems like it, it should be important, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't, sometimes I satisfy myself by saying, well, Ed, we may not have restored the relationship, but at least we may have eliminated one barrier to the restoration of that relationship, which is we've eliminated a piece of litigation over who's going to inherit X, Y, or Z. And if we can at least eliminate a barrier to the restoration of relationships, I, I in the old days I used to say I drive home, but now I just uh, take off my necktie <laughs> and go to the next room. I say to myself, these, you know, this family, they may not all be getting together for Christmas dinner this year, but maybe in some way we've cast them down a path where they can get together for Christmas dinner as a happy family in five years. And if I have that thought that perhaps I've set that uh, on its course, I, I think it's a good day. So we are about out of time. It's two minutes before the hour. This has been a spectacular hour. I want to take the moderator's prerogative one last time. Those of you who remember the old Ed Sullivan show on TV know that Ed used to call out celebrities and dignitaries in the audience. And the great Tom Stepanowich is with us today, I believe, for the first time. Uh, Tom is one of the executive directors of the Strauss Institute for Dispute Resolution at Pepperdine, now Pepperdine Caruso School of Law here in Southern California. Uh, Tom is previously the president of CPR and has his writings, his speaking, his leadership in the alternative dispute resolution profession makes him one of the titans. And Tom, now that you've been in the audience, we're going to invite you to present one day soon. You can expect me to be in, or Ed Jean to be in touch with you on that. So, um, with that, thank you to Emily, to Jeff, to Jody. This has been terrific. Jean, thank you so much for being a wonderful co-host. Natalie, thank you for founding the Will Work for Food project almost one full year ago now. Uh, Jean, Natalie, any final comments, please? Uh, it's just great to see everyone come back every Thursday morning. There's something new and interesting, and we'd love to see you. Absolutely. Natalie? 
I just wanted to, you know, encourage everyone to let us know if you have a topic that you'd like for us to locate a speaker to present upon, or if you want to be a speaker or recommend a speaker, be sure you reach out to us. We can't always anticipate what it is that you'd like to learn or hear about. So let us know and we will do our absolute utmost to fill that void in a future program. Absolutely. My, fr my friends, thank you all so much. We'll see you next Thursday morning, I hope. And with that, we are complete.